you, everyone, and good afternoon. As my wonderful friend Diana said, I come device-free. I invite you to enjoy a story, a story about a city that since its founding has been searching for its identity, starting out as a trading post with a moat around it to protect it, soon became a center of commerce. Developing itself, there was always the search for who is a Berliner? What is Berlin? And what would Berlin become? Now, I'm going to do my best in the next few minutes to compile these volumes of history and information into a comprehensive story. We begin with the mid-1800s. Like a black and white film in front of you, we see a bustling city. Industry is already underway. We have incredible inventions going on, steel and coal industry, the AEG with its electricity, and others. But more important, one of the most prominent industries of Berlin, the rail industry, railways, tracks, and the development of the locomotive, locomotive engineering. Berlin is synonymous with machine and engineering development. Who knew? So mid-1800s, we're seeing the Borsigwerke in Tegel creating its new high-speed engines. We see AEG working on the light bulb and the ever-development of electricity. At the same time, the coal industry giving something for laborers to carry and transport via the many canals of Berlin. The city, known for its three-story housing, would soon develop into five-story housing, tenements, and glorious boulevards. Still under royal rule in the 1800s, it was Otto Bismarck in 1871, then the prime minister, that declared Berlin the capital of a now unified Germany. Well, this was met with tremendous resistance. It was an industrial city. It was a city known for great tolerance. It was also a city known for its nightlife. Still, in the 1800s, we see even more development. Again, the AEG, a major electric corporation, having worked with Thomas Edison and becoming the Deutsche Edison, so the German Edison Electric Company, started developing appliances, electric transport. The, the light bulb with the small wire would soon light homes and houses. Industry was constantly growing. So, by the 1900s, beginning of the 1900s, we see something else. Now, the royals living in Berlin, Berlin with its beautiful castles, there was a desire to connect a brand new church, the Kaiser Wilhelm Church, now in the center of the West. Well, he wanted to connect that beautiful church with the royal hunting lodges in Grunewald Forest. So there was a request for a large boulevard to be laid, and it was done, creating work and jobs. The boulevard we know today as Kurfürstendamm. This boulevard would draw the wealthy, the rich, the prominent. Houses along the boulevard would be built, five, six stories with grand apartments, eight, 10, 12 rooms, places for, for maids, a large kitchen, rooms to welcome guests. Building development in Berlin would continue. These large prominent houses to the front with their ever-connecting courtyards, where in the back the workers and maids and laborers could live, but the front lived the prominent. Along the Kaffirstendam, people would stroll, especially on the afternoons in the summer. There popped up slowly grand shops, beautiful cafes, and you were there to be seen. Come the 1900s, to serve this ever-growing population, once 820,000, soon 1 million, a new concept was created, something to provide a special place, shopping, you know, a place to purchase things, all the wares coming into this vibrant city. This concept was also based on hmm, places in London, places in Paris, a brand new store would open and would offer everything from 
sapphires to sardines, petticoats to pocket watches, something for everyone in an elegant atmosphere. 1907, we see the grand opening of the Kaufhaus des Westens, or KDV. This exemplified the growing passion for this city, the change of population, already international. Living in Berlin were many different nationalities. Also among them, French, Dutch, Polish, Austrian, and Turkish. Many came to Berlin to vacation, but many came to Berlin to escape. We already saw the presentation of the new Deutsche Oper, or the Neues Theater, the new theater on Schifferbaumdamm. Later, that theater would be known as the Bertolt Brecht Theater, a theater that didn't only present entertainment, but political satire. There, the people could speak via theater. At the same time, we're entering an interesting period of great industrialization, great exchange, commerce. But along with that, there's an international competition. Soon, we head directly into World War I, a dark period. 1914 to 1918, war is raging. This country leading the way with its incredible inventions, electricity, tanks of metal. Many of the industries would then be directed towards the war efforts. Everything would be to support the country. However, this depleted the country. And Berlin, the railway industry, the Borsigwerke, would be led to build tanks, all the metal to go to guns and machines. There was a pause in industry. On November 9, 1918, here in Berlin, the people already war weary. The Charité Hospital, filled with the war injured and dying, took to the streets in a grand revolution. Stop the war, they said. Coming in droves in large numbers, the government took notice. Now, it would not be fair of me to say that that revolution was responsible for the end of World War I, but many think the people influenced this, and these were the people of Berlin. World War I comes to an end. Industry is collapsed, and yet there's a need to rebuild, a need to bring back the vibrancy of the city. But one thing that never stopped was the nightlife. Since the mid-1800s, people came to Berlin to escape. We move into the Weimar Republic, or the time of the golden 20s. We liken it to films, one most famous, Cabaret. However, there was despair. People were war weary. There was hunger, there was inflation. Many people didn't have enough money for food on their table. Families were suffering in Berlin. Industry was at a halt. But people still escaped into the nightlife, into the clubs, the bars, where you could buy everything from gin to flesh. Dance, theater, film began to boom with names like Marlene Dietrich, Fritz Lang, Bertolt Brecht. A new piece opened in that theater, a piece that ran for 147 performances consecutively. This was not common at the time, a piece that spoke about the suffering, about the people, not the glorious royals or with bravado. It was spoken with true words. The name of the piece? The Three Penny Opera. You know that song. Oh, the shark has teeth like razors. It was a hard-edged piece, a piece that brought people to think what is going on. So the Weimar years were years of contradiction. On one hand, we had political unrest, a series of parties fighting for power. An, uh, I don't want to say a useless government, but a government that didn't have clarity, didn't have drive. The Treaty of Versailles held Germany responsible for the destruction of World War I. Germany was forced to pay high reparations, its industry taken away from it. 
Many foreigners took over those industries. So there was ever increasing suffering and you saw it in the cities, you saw it in the streets of Berlin. If anyone knows the painting through illustrations by Otto Dix, they weren't beautiful, they were grotesque. And we saw that injury, we saw that struggle. But again, I come to the nightlife. The nightlife is what we think of when we think about Berlin and the golden 20s. Some of those clubs you can find today. Well, in all this unrest, this contradiction, this wild nightlife, drinking, dancing, music, drugs, alcohol, was this unrest politically. Berlin would become the center of a new chapter. During those years, new parties came up out of the ashes, angry, full of vengeance, wanting to regain identity. One party was developed and found the perfect person to be the speaker of that party, a man full of revenge, full of anger, and with a very penetrating voice. His name? Adolf Hitler. We move into the year 1933. We like to think of the 30s as a time of glorious fashion, music, wild parties. But 1933 would be a marker year, especially for Berlin. In that year, Adolf Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany. And with that, everything changes. Now, I'm not here to speak about the history of World War II. We know it all too well. But important to know is what happened to the industry as well. Remember, during those Weimar years, under the Treaty of Versailles, industry was taken away from Germany, especially from Berlin, including the steel, the coal, the metal, these inventions, science. This culture of science was so important in Berlin, also stemming from the Humboldt University and Friedrich Wilhelm's Society of Science and Culture. Well, this one man was very well aware of that and the brilliant minds of Berlin, the building, the engineering, the mechanics that could be created here. After becoming chancellor, there's a mysterious attack on the Reichstag. It's burnt down. Nobody took claim, but some were blamed on those of a communist party. To this day, we don't know who committed that act, but what that act created was the Enabling Act. And with that, the word of the country's leader became law. This would change everything. And for Berlin, that freedom, that sense of crazy wild nightlife, the ability to speak out freely, whether it's theater, through the news, or on stands in the street would soon be lost. People would be manipulated and controlled through law and concept. But again, I'm not here to talk about the history of World War II. In that period, industry was made use of. Those who had taken over the industries were kicked out. It was returned to those of the country, especially here in Berlin. Railways, steel, the building of rail tracks, the electric industry, appliance industry. In 1928, we saw the first television coming out of Berlin industry. Radio was being improved, radio telegraph, radio communication was being improved, and a lot of it was centered here. But the war also allowed the country to rebuild those industries. One major one, which would also incorporate steel, mechanics, engineering, was aviation. I ask you, why was aviation and the building of the National Air Defense Program for Hitler and his leader of the department, Hermann Goering, so important? What technology did we see for the first time in World War I? The airplane. This changed everything. So with this takeover and the word is law, industry could be directed towards the plans of one group, of one ideology. But it did offer jobs. It did offer a chance to make money. It did offer the ability to come out of the extreme inflation, the extreme poverty, the extreme unemployment we saw in the Weimar years. No longer would you require one million rice marks for a loaf of bread, if you could have found that loaf of bread. Now industry was restarted. 
So with that, radio, television, in 1935, coming out of Berlin, the Nazis had their first national broadcast via television, utilizing, of course, radio. We know that for sure. But the, the advancement of television and this was not prevalent only to Berlin, but also here and, and another point in Frankfurt. The radar was being refined. The radar would change everything, especially during the war years, as bombardments became ever more increasing and the destruction around Europe would be ever greater. But technology was involved. The war inspired technological advancement, sadly. We leave World War II behind us. It is now 1945. Many of you know the war ended with the suicide of Adolf Hitler, his one-night bride family, and many of the parties, uh, members of his party. But the war actually officially ended on May 8, 1945, with the unconditional surrender of the country to the Allied forces. We now enter the next chapter, the rebuilding of a country. Now, I do like to add this. This is important to know. We know that the country laid in ruins. Berlin, somewhere between 60 and 80% was destroyed. The numbers, the accurate numbers are nowhere to be found. But we know the city laid in rubble after heavy bombardments by the Allied forces and the advancements of the Soviets from the East. So now came the process of rebuilding. This process would also add to industry, advancement, and the mood of a city. Berlin, among other cities in Germany, was very quick to get back to normalcy. The people wanted to get back to normalcy. We no longer politicize who those people are. They're simply the citizens of Berlin. Well, we also know that the city was divided into four sectors. The Soviets to the east and to the west, the Western Allies, divided among the British, French, and the USA. The French took the north of West Berlin. To the center was the British sector, and to the south, the Americans. This would lead to another chapter. Tensions would grow between East and West. The country divided and equally Berlin, and Berlin plays such an important part of this next chapter. We start heading into tensions between East and West, and with that, even more technological advancements, but the kind that we don't really like to think about. As the tensions grew, we experienced not only the Great Blockade and the Great Airlift of 1948 and 1949, but the establishment of government, the Federal Republic of Germany to the west and the German Democratic Republic to the east, with the Soviet oversight. But the line could never be clearer. With the chemical inventions, pharmaceuticals, the invention and advancement of products that were both good for us as human beings and deadly to us as human beings. We would become, we'd come and advance into a new game, the Cold War. And here we see a new kind of development, a new kind of science. But again, I don't want to focus on that, but rather Berlin. I jumped to 1961. Having lost millions of people legally through West Berlin, as they made legal exit out of the East, out of Soviet-controlled East Germany and East Berlin, they could go to the steps of Schoenberg, go to the city hall, and apply for legal exit. Well, as they did, the Soviets took notice, the East Germans took notice. As this was happening, they were losing bright young minds, engineers, doctors, lawyers. They were all taking off with their families, needing to exit out of this single ideology and make their way west to a new free democratic, social demo democracy. Between 1955 and 1961, over 3.1 million people left through West Berlin. The Soviets taking notice, that gave the order. The night of August 12th to August 13th, West Berlin is isolated behind barbed wire. It is separated from the east and isolated in East German territory. We know that famous photo of one tank on the other. The tension between East and West couldn't have been more real. We also know that John F. Kennedy made his trip to West Berlin, stood on the steps of Schoenberg, gave his famous speech, but in the background said, all right, well, we have to accept this for now. A wall is better than war. This was seen as great aggression. 
But strangely enough, just to get back to Berlin and not focus on the dark period of the Cold War, we see something special happen. People adapt. It was not easy, especially those families that were separated, those families that were through that barbed wire separated for a lifetime. Young married couples, grandmother, granddaughter, and so on. This was a very difficult period. But the people within West Berlin adapted. 1965 to 1969, we see a demonstration by the east of the city. We see the development of something that we find right outside these doors. The Fernsehturm. The East Germans wanted to demonstrate their ability to build and their technology. It was in question of this was attempt to spy on the West. But actually, in fact, it was simply architecture. It was construction. And with a restaurant on top that would rotate. But the thing about the Fernsehturm, everyone in West Berlin could see it. It was a clear signal. But West Berlin in the 1960s and 70s kind of got on with it. They adapted to the checkpoints. Eventually, there would be looser laws where West Berliners could travel into the East to family those friends, those members of their family. They would have to return, leaving West Deutschmarks behind. But at least the doors were opening. But what we also saw was the revival of nightlife. But now, no longer the sounds of the 20s and the 30s. Now we've got rock and roll. We've got a scene called the punk musicians moving in. And between 1975 and 1979, a famous rock artist came to live in Berlin. Berlin, West Berlin, the symbol of freedom. A free West city in a sea of Soviet-controlled East Germany. His name? I bet you know. David Bowie, that's right. David Bowie became a symbol for Western musicians, artists, those wanting to be a part of something special, something that wasn't easy, something that stood for the rest of the Western world as a symbol of resistance. During that time, he wrote one of his most famous albums, Heroes. And when you listen to it, you can hear the influence on his music of the city of Berlin at the time. West Berlin, enclosed behind a wall, the dead man's zone, controlled by agents, constantly being spied on. And to the east of the city, a whole other world was playing out under caution, constantly watched, and yet with a desire to live a normal life. We move to our next chapter. After a series of conversations, some demonstrations, and the look at the economy of the city of Berlin, East German government realizes it's not working, and the Soviets have to begin a discussion. This is not working anymore. We're actually losing, isolating ourselves from the rest of the Western world. So an order is given in the night of November 8th to November 9th to open up the checkpoints and let everyone pass through. Well, this part of the story is where I just kind of come alive. That morning, news reports have gone out. The wall is open. The wall of Berlin is open. People are coming through. The wall might be coming down. I and my friend, like thousands of people, millions actually, almost 1.9 million in the west of Berlin, made our way towards that wall. The point at Bernauerstrasse, but especially Brandenburger Tour. We walked, we left the car, we walked down the boulevard, made our way to the Brandenburger Tour, and there were people jumping on top of the wall. The guards had put their guns down. The checkpoints were open. Passageways were letting people stream into the West. It was so exciting. As a New Yorker in Berlin, to experience that moment of history for myself, changed so much for me and my love for this city. Watching people come in that week, and it was said almost two million came from the East to visit West Berlin, where tables and benches were set up, every store and shop opened its doors, beer was flowing, drinks were flowing, and everyone could enjoy a real West Berliner Corywurst. It was a very special time. 
soon after, in, in dedication to this, was a huge concert. The Wall and the lead singer of Pink Floyd. Little did people know they were still clearing landmines out of that area while they were building up the stage. It was a little scary. But this rock concert represented a new period. Berlin was finally reunified once again. And now we move into the current period. We move into the 1990s. As you know, October 3rd, 1990, was the official reunification of Germany. But it was a special time. It was as if there was a new enthusiasm. There was a new desire, not only to be one, but to welcome others, to be the great bustling international city Berlin was always meant to be. But there was also a need for a new identity. Opening its doors internationally to everyone coming in, it also opened its doors to investment, commerce, new businesses, new ideas. There was a great desire to get into the historic areas of Berlin and restore, rebuild, and renew. You could see it all over, Potsdam Platz, with its what seemed like thousands of cranes moving like giant dinosaurs to rebuild that area into a whole new center of commerce. We saw banks coming in, we saw money flowing, and this wonderful spirit, the love parade, making its way through the city into the tear garden, everyone dancing, naked, woo! But it was a spirit of Berlin. It was a spirit that we knew in the 1800s, in the 1900s, the 1920s, a feeling of freedom, of tolerance, by the 1912, uh, 1912, 2012, 2015, we saw something else happen. Technology's moving in, and the tech upstarts. This phenomenon has almost overtaken a portion of Berlin in such a crazy way that many people, also in America, colleagues of mine in California, New York, and so on, are asking, is it really easy to join in on those startups in Berlin? Well, I tell them it's easy enough. Berlin is one of the states in Germany that offers so much opportunity to entrepreneurs and tech startups. They want these new fresh minds, engineers, minds of mathematics. They want you. They want to create a world of the future. So while we're restoring the past, while colleagues of mine are digging and discovering the tunnels, the bunkers, the passageways of a part of history that's so important to remember, the city itself has opened its doors to newness, to something bright, to a bright future. We know that in the beginning, when this introduction of the tech startup funding was created, there were about 820 groups now, according to some records, records of commerce, there's over 126 million registered entrepreneurs and startups involved in this industry. You are part of a new future of Berlin. And with that, we see a revival of, of not only industry, but wealth, fortune, investment. And Berlin is once again a bustling, growing city. And with this, I conclude my story, but I ask a question before I leave. Do you think it's important to remember the past as we look forward to the future? As I leave, I ask you to ponder that question. And with that, I've concluded my story. Thank you so much for listening. I hope I could give you an impression of Berlin. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.